if, if you logged in. Um, so we wanted to, to talk about these specific um, topics because firstly, there are a lot of specific funding opportunities that are relevant here. Also, because we have never done it before. Um, so I'll start by uh, talking about the, the funding landscape itself. Um, we do see that these funding sources support more or less everything from discovery to phase three clinical trials. If we look at uh, very early stage work, um, discovery stage, very early stage clinical with uh, preclinical with very little preliminary data, if any at all, we see that the grants typically start with two, three hundred thousand dollars up to about half a million dollars. More advanced stages, still preclinical or early stage clinical, you should typically expect half a million to about three. And when we talk about advanced work, advanced clinical trials, um, grants typically start with about two, three million dollars and, and of course the sky's the limit. So we'll, we'll try and, and talk about uh, some of these and, and uh, keep it relevant for all stages of development. So I, I would like to start with uh, the National Institute on Aging, the NIA, which is a part of the National Institutes of Health, the NIH. Overall, we see that uh, the NIH themselves, uh, basically these are 27 institutes and centers. And um, Alzheimer's and dementia are covered through the NIA. Although you'll see that some neurodegenerative diseases are not always covered by them. For example, Parkinson's is covered uh, by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Um, the focus today will be uh, NIA related opportunities, but if what you do is somewhat different, please make sure that you look into the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke or the NINDS um, before, of course, giving up on, on the NIH. So when we take a deeper dive into the NIA, um, we can see that their budget is, is pretty, uh, pretty significant. They have uh, $2.654 billion for 2020. And as you can see, most of it goes out to fund uh, research project grants over $2 billion, but other th sections of the budget have a lot to do with the funding uh, R&D work as well. The projects that we'll be talking about today and, and the opportunities are definitely a part of the extramural research that they support. When we talk about submission types or funding routes, we typically, uh, especially if we're talking about the NIH, we focus on two different mechanisms. The first one is solicited opportunities. Uh, these address specific area of interest. Um, it's, it's relatively easy to, to spot them because you'll see that they are incredibly clear and it'll just talk about the specific mission of the specific funding opportunity. In addition to that, we have the unsolicited or the omnibus solicitations. Uh, we call them investigator initiated opportunities. And the idea is that you can just pitch your idea to the NIH through these, um, uh, through these funding routes. And it's all about establishing the interests of the funding agency before the submission itself. The classical mechanisms for the unsolicited Opportunities are the R21, R1, and the SBR, CTR, and we'll talk about them um, as we continue. Um, but when we talk about uh, the interest of the funding agencies, it's relatively easy uh, because uh, you know they they will tell you. Um, so most agencies will have notices of special special interests. We call them nosy, and uh, this is a list of most of the National Institute on Aging's uh, interests. So I'll just uh, mention some of them here, but of course this is the list. The, list. Uh, the role of infectious agents as contributors to Alzheimer's disease, identification of genes and gene networks, uh, research on ameliorates, uh, let's see, uh, digital technology for early detection of Alzheimer's disease. And, and as you can see, uh, 
the list is, is there. It is pretty diverse, sex and gender differences in Alzheimer's disease and related dimensions. Um, and I definitely recommend going into the National Institute on Aging's uh, website and, and you'll find the, the whole list. I want us to start talking about preclinical stage funding. And the most relevant mechanisms here are the R21, the SBAR, phase one and phase two, and the R01. The most important element is, of course, to stay the course and ensure that you do correlate the granting strategy with your long-term R&D plan. This is also true and, and unfortunately not as trivial if we're talking about preclinical work, um, but they do need to see that you know where you're going with this. So the fact that this is a very early stage project should not, um, of course, uh, 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 make you avoid the fact that they are looking at the entire picture as they award you and in a way invest in, in your project. So make sure that you address those as well. So I'll start with uh, briefly talking about the SBR and STTR mechanisms. These are opportunities that are relevant for domestic for-profit companies, uh, small businesses to be exact. You need to make sure that the, the company is mostly US owned and that the work is done within the US. If you want some more information on the SBR CTR program, we have many webinars on our YouTube channel. So firstly, um, the SBR itself, uh, again, is a mechanism for small business innovation research grant applications. It's divided into a phase one and a phase two. The phase one is typically up to $250,000 and up to six months. Phase twos are for 1.7 million and up to two years. And there are combination between the phase one and the phase twos. Again, not going into that. Um, the STTR is basically an opportunity for industry academia collaborations. If you are a for-profit small business and you have a collaboration with an academic, with the university, big research institute, this is the opportunity for you. The amounts are similar, $250,000. Here, for phase one, you can have a project that is up to 12 months long. And with a phase two, 1.7 million for up to two years. The deadlines are January 5th, April 5th, and September 5th. Um, so make sure that uh, you get everything done in time. Um, a nice thing about submitting SBRs and STTRs to the National Institute on Aging is that they have something called a waiver, which is the Institute's way of increasing uh, these amounts as well. So for projects aiming to address Alzheimer's disease and related dimensions, applicants are encouraged to consider the following funding opportunities, which allow up to half a million for phase one and 2.5 million for phase two. So if we'll come back to the previous slide, these are the actual numbers. Bear in mind that this is true for the NIA. Other agencies have their waivers. Uh, some have uh, the, the normal amounts, but in this case, these are the numbers that you could uh, submit, which is obviously a plus uh, because more money means getting more things done. Um, so if we look at what's relevant for preclinical stage funding, Firstly, with SBRs and STTRs, we have testing of lifespan and lifespan and health span extension interventions in the models of Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's disease related dementia. This is an R, this is a, an STTR. And I, I made sure to write the solicitation numbers so it'll be easier to look them up. Um, we have advancing research on Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease related dimensions um, as well. Um, and I also listed the investigator initiative opportunities. So here we have the STTR and the SBAR opportunities as well. Um, and the next a uh, type of, of mechanism that I want us to talk about is the R01 and the R21. These are the, the NIH is exploratory and more advanced uh, stage projects. 
With the R21, the budget is 275,000 in direct costs and overhead on top of that. The projects are up to two years and uh, typically we see that the entire amount is about $300,000. With RO1s, these are the more advanced uh, projects, definitely very relevant to preclinical work as well. But bear in mind that you're justifying up to five years long of work. So you need to be very organized and, and tell a very compelling story. These grants allow for about half a million dollar per year. Add on to that the overhead cost and you get uh, to about $3 million. I will say that if you look at most of these solicitations, you'll see that there is no official budget cap. They removed those about two years ago, uh, again, in an effort of, of making sure that you're able to pitch your idea that they'll be able to make exceptions. But I, it is important to say that these are the amounts more or less that they expect to see. So make sure that you talk to the program officers before you ask for more. Um, and by the way, generally talk to them. They're, they're great. They're very helpful. Uh, but just uh, for you to, to know what they're hoping to see. So uh, some specifics. Uh, firstly, sensory and motor system changes as predictors of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. This is an R01. Human cell biology of Alzheimer's disease genetic variants. Uh, early stage clinical trials for the spectrum of Alzheimer's disease and age-related cognitive decline. I know that we're talking preclinical stage funding, but this opportunity doesn't actually, um, it, it actually allows you for, for, sorry, for applicants to not have a clinical trial here. So I added that just to be on the safe side. Um, and we also have research, research on current topics in Alzheimer's disease and its related dimensions. We have it as an R21 and an R01, so make sure that you, uh, uh, you, you make uh, the best decision here, of course, depending on the stage of work. Some more opportunities, um, new and unconventional animal models for, Al for Alzheimer's disease, which I thought is, is very interesting. Behavioral and technological interventions to annotate cognitive decline in individuals with cognitive impairment or dementia. We have that as an R21 and as an R01. And of course, the NIH research grant or the parent R01, just in case you're doing something that is relevant, but is not exactly what uh, they listed. Don't be afraid to, to go for the, the investigator initiator opportunity. Most of the NIH grants, are awarded through uh, the parent announcements. And uh, it, it might make better sense to go for the general, general one and not the specific opportunity if it's not an exact fit. Okay, so that's, uh, that's preclinical pre uh, stage funding. If we talk about clinical stage funding, firstly, um, we have early stage and late stage clinical trials for the spectrum of Alzheimer's disease and age-related cognitive decline. We have both uh, the first and the second R01. Um, the last two applications here are advancing research on Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease-related dimensions. Uh, this is an, uh, an SBAR and an STTR. Again, relevant for domestic small businesses only. Um, some more... Um, some more opportunities. Research on current topics in Alzheimer's disease and its related dimensions. This is an R01. Behavioral and technological interventions to attitude cognitive decline in, in individuals with cognitive impairment or dementia. We have this R21 and the R01. This, these two can include a clinical trial if, if that's needed. Um, and again, the, the, the parent R01, that requires a clinical uh, clinical trial. By the way, make sure that even as you're, su as you're submitting a parent announcement, note that they have specific parent announcements for preclinical and clinical work. So make sure that you're submitting the most suitable one for you. So that's it with the NIH. Uh, another 
agency that I want to talk about is the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. This is a non-government grant. They're great. We love working with them. Um, we will talk about two of their programs for preclinical work. They have the drug development program up to $600,000. And for clinical work, they have a program called Program to Accelerate Clinical Trials. Pretty straightforward. Um, applicants start by submitting a letter of intent and then hopefully uh, the full proposal if, if they're uh, invited. Um, the current target areas are listed there. So we have epi epigenetics, inflammation, mitochondria, vascular function, and, and uh, as, as you can see, the list is, is uh, pretty, pretty helpful. Um, so let's start with the preclinical opportunity. Um, so the, the focus of, of this opportunity is building preclinical evidence in animal models and on advancing lead molecules to the clinical candidate selection stage. Proposed studies should have high probability of reaching IID enabling studies within two years. Um, they, more specifically, they support preclinical pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, target engagement, um, and uh, of course, preliminary rodent tolerability, in vitro efficiency, or proof of concept studies. Note that uh, this is not about very basic science. So if you're still trying to identify your target, do any validation, assay development, or high throughput, high throughput uh, screening, these are not the applications that they're looking to fund. So um, you know, just make sure that you're not wasting your time. They have four deadlines every year. This is the list that you can see the table below. Uh, of the 2020 deadlines, and uh, there's only one that's relevant, October 9th. More than enough time to make a submission, um, and we, of course, recommend. Next up is the clinical stage program. Um, basically, it supports uh, two, uh, two specific topics. Firstly, early stage human trial, including uh, phase one single ascending dose and multiple ascending dose studies, biomarker-based proof of concept or proof of mechanism studies, uh, regulatory studies, uh, including uh, a few other topics as well, non-GLP, GLP, long-term toxicity, GMP manufacturing studies, uh, and, and so on. The 2020 deadlines are the same, so we're still talking about October 9th and November 6th. Um, Next up is another agency, and that is a, a part of the DOD. It's called, the program is called the Conversely Directed Medical Research Programs. And I know that it's not very intuitive, but uh, in reality, the DOD supports veterans and their family members as well. So although they'll ask you for military relevance, this is it. And they have a pretty wide scope through the CDMRP, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs. Uh, I'll just call them the CMRP because, uh, well, it, it takes a while. <laughs> um, so they have a, a program that comes out once a year, uh, typically around the spring. And among the list of topics that they have that is always very diverse, the Alzheimer program is something that comes out every year. So, um, Similar to what we talked about before, this also has a two-phased uh, review process. We start with the pre-application, then hopefully invited, uh, the applicants are invited to submit the full proposal. By the way, it is great. Uh, you're not wasting your time. They're not wasting their time. Everyone's happy. Uh, this year specifically, the deadlines for the pre-application were June 22nd and for the full application, July 20th. July 20. 21st. Um, the indications that they had this year was Alzheimer's dementia, Lowy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, mixed dementia, and vascular dementia. And uh, specifically, they looked for fluid-based biomarkers, imaging-based biomarkers, retinal biomarkers, and wearable devices. Uh, and they listed and more. So they did encourage applicants to, to try and, and, and talk to them to see if it makes sense to submit an application, which again is something I always recommend. 
talk to the people running this program, they have people whose job is to talk to you and make sure that this is a good fit. Make sure you use that function. Um, and, and in terms of specific opportunities, uh, that's, that's what all we have for today. I just wanted to add a word on, on how you could maximize your chances of being successful. So firstly, we need to remember that we have to lower the risk of the funding agencies. It is a risk assessment process, so very similar to what you'll have with any type of investor. It's just their goals are a bit different. Make sure that you understand what they want to see, what they want to fund, and, and make sure that you are compliant with that. But that doesn't mean that you have to compromise your R&D plan, your long-term R&D plan, because if you are funded and you have a project that you do not want to see through, you haven't really done much. And of course, uh, it is very important to know your weaknesses and find partners if you need any help. The fact that you're addressing the, you know, the, the problems that you have within the team doesn't make you weak. It doesn't mean that you're not capable. It just means that you are very much aware of what you have and, and what you need. And, and that's, that, that goes a very long way when a reviewer uh, reads the, uh, the application. If you need to have an expert of some kind, make sure that you get them ahead of time, of course. Um, and and that's, uh, that, that's a very good way to make sure that you're submitting a well-balanced application. So that's, uh, that's it for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. My email is listed below. If you've enjoyed it, enjoyed this webinar very much and you want to hear some more webinars, we have a very active YouTube channel. You can also find us on LinkedIn and on Twitter. So uh, thank you all for your time and uh, have a great day.